the correct supply injection is smooth and it has a smooth inverse, so it has also like a lock, um, a lock, uh, for an inverse which is called the, lock, the Riemannian lock function. It impacts the manifold to the, the whole tangent space as well. Okay, basically just the inverse of the, of the, uh, the exponential map that it maps the manifold to the, uh, basically it can, you can, we can flatten the manifold. That is the idea, we can flatten the manifold um, using this log map. But this is actually a very special feature of this um, non-positive uh, non curvature. It's a very uh, a nice property of the SPD uh, matrices. Okay, so a Riemannian manifold has two components, a smooth manifold and a Riemannian matrix. So every smooth manifold has a unique, uh, has a Riemannian, sorry, has a Riemannian matrix, but uh, these Riemannian metrics are not unique. And so with each uh, Riemannian metric, we can actually have a, a different notion of distance on, on M. So let's talk about here, we have, um, let's talk about the affine variant metric and the log Riemannian metric. So as a manifold, this, um, the set of SPD metric as a manifold it has some, um, well, it's a smooth, it's, a, it's an open subset of the set of all the symmetric uh, matrices. And so it's a smooth manifold of dimension n times n plus one over, over two because like, we, only, we only need to represent like the, the upper triangular. And the tangent space turns out to be actually the, um, the, 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 the set of, the, the, the vector space of symmetric uh, matrices, just seam n. So we define the Riemannian, so this actually, this has, this has been studied um, extensively in mathematics, actually start, starting from at least 1943. So from a very long time ago, actually. And um, so there are a lot of recent work, and I'm just mentioning some of the work here, but actually there's a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of work in, in mathematics. So when we talk about metric, as I, as, as I said, we need to define the notion of uh, inner product on the tangent space. So on the tangent space, uh, which is the symmetric uh, matrix, uh, the set of symmetric um, matrices uh, seam n, we, 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 we have like two um, tangent vector, which is a symmetric matrices V and W, then the tangents, uh, the inner product is defined by the formula over there. So VW, P is equal to the inner product, the Frobenius inner product of P inverse a half, V, P inverse a half, and with the same thing in W, and this is just equal to the trace of P inverse V and P inverse W. Now this allows, um, now with this formula, we can actually verify that it's a phi invariance because it, we transform both A, B, and P by the same, by the same transformation. So C, A, C transpose, C, B, C transpose, and C, P, C transpose by the, the same invertible matrix C, then this inner product stays the same. So this is the definition of the, uh, the affine invariant Riemannian matrix. It's actually the, um, the inner product on the tangent space. And we can compute for this, uh, we can compute uh, many things explicitly. We can, uh, it's a uh, geodesic, geodesically complete Riemannian manifold. It, it has non-positive curvature. So every, between every two points, um, A and B, symmetric, between any uh, two SPD matrices A and B, there's a, a geodesic, um, a unique geodesic joining them, and it's given by an explicit formula, gamma A, B, T here. So you can check that gamma A, B at zero is equal to A, and gamma B, a, B at one is equal to B. Now we have the, so we have the formula for the, for the geodesic and we have the formula for computing the, um, the distance of the curve, for, for, for the Riemannian matrix. So we can compute the length of this curve and the length of this curve is given by just the log of A inverse a half B times uh, A inverse a half, where log of A is uh, the principal logarithm of A. It's defined by um, computing the, the spectral decomposition, decomposition of A and then we take the, um, the log of the, all the eigenvalues. So this can be computed explicitly. And uh, so uh, it's, it's a fine variance, so the distance is a fine variance, we transform A and B by the same, by the same transformation, then the distance stays the same, and a particular case of that is actually a scale invariant, and then it's a unitary uh, invariant, so these are, we were talking about that just now, and its invariants are under inversions. And in particular, it's a complete metric space because it's a geodesically complete Riemannian manifold, so it's a complete metric space, so it's a very nice uh, metric space. So inversion invariance, so the distance between A inverse and B inverse is the same as A and B, and actually it can be verified directly by this formula as well. 
So it has a close connection with the Fisher Round metric in information geometry. Basically, the distance between uh, C1 and C2 is just a, the Fisher Round, like two times the Fisher Round distance between two Gaussian densities uh, with the same mean and the same, uh, and the, the covariance, which is the C1 and C2. But this, okay, but this is, I'm, I'm just mentioning this to say that it actually has a very close connection with, uh, with some other branches of, uh, of um, statistics. So to compute this, now we, we can compute the eigenvalues. To compute this distance, we can compute the eigenvalue of um, A inverse of half B inverse of half, we, or we can compute the eigenvalues of A inverse B. Now these actually have the same eigenvalues, and so we can just compute the summation of the, um, the log of lambda k uh, square. So re this requires eigen, either, either the, the matrix inversion in either the, the SVD or the uh, eigenvalue computation of all the, of the matrices A inverse B. So it has time complexity O and three. So it's, it's not, uh, this, this is not a cheap uh, metric to, to compute. So if we have like a set of, uh, if we have a set of all, um, all SPD, like N SPD matrices and we want to compute all the pairwise distances and we have to compare, to compute uh, that formula over there for O, I, and J, you know, the, one thing is actually this, um, in this formula, it's like we notice that the matrices A, I, and H, A actually are coupled together. So for, we have to do this for every pair A, I, and H, A. So the computational complexity is actually N square, O, N square, big N square times N Q. So it's actually quite large when N is large because actually it scales uh, with N square. So this is the reason why we, um, this computational complexity is one reason why we actually, uh, people have considered um, other, other um, metrics as well. That is um, the, one of the motivations for the, the, the log Euclidean metric. Okay. So the, lo the log Euclidean metric actually has, um, it's actually is a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting metric. It has a few interpretations. So it can be viewed. Now it can be viewed as um, as a Riemannian metric itself on the set of SPD matrices, or it can be viewed. Uh, or the, the log of the distance can be viewed as an approximation of the affine variant distance. Now, a lot of people have considered this the second view as an approximation of the affine invariant distance, but this view is actually not complete. Uh, so it can be viewed as a log, as, as a Riemannian metric in itself. And uh, it's not the same as the, uh, the Euclidean distance because it has uh, different um, invariance properties. So this, um, even though the, ma um, the manifold under this metric is actually flat, but it's actually not the same as the Euclidean metric. So this was formally uh, defined in, um, in, in 2007, 2007, with some earlier work as well by, by the same group, Asini, Pilat, Fenech, and uh, Ayashe. And it's so they treat it as a Riemannian metric on, on the set of SPD matrices. And so it's much faster to compute than the affine variant distance on large sets of matrices. And one nice property in terms of machine learning is actually it can be used to define any positive dynamic kernels on, on, on SPD matrices. So that is another, another desirable property. Now, so Asini et al. actually talk about the, the log Euclidean metric as a Riemannian metric and not as an approximation to the affine invariant metric. So on the tangent space, so it actually has a very complicated, uh, it has a very complicated um, definition on the, uh, this is the definition of the, uh, of the Riemannian metric actually, so we don't have to worry about it because actually we would not need to use it. But basically here D is uh, the derivative of the function log that maps the S uh, simplest M to the, to the, uh, to the to scheme M. And so it's actually at each point, at each uh, point B, it's actually uh, a linear map. So we actually don't need to use, we don't need to use, uh, we don't need to know the, the explicit, uh, uh, the explicit knowledge of this, uh, um, this map actually to, to compute the geodesics and the Riemannian distance. But this is the, the definition of the, uh, of the Riemannian metric. And it can be shown that it has a, uh, between any two points in the, under this metric, between any, any two um, matrices A and B, there's a unique geodesic joining them. And it has a, so the geodesic actually has a, a very simple formula. It has a, so just exponential one minus T log A and then plus T log B. So when T is equal to zero, you have um, A, and when T is equal to one, we have uh, B. 
And the distance is also very simple. So compared to the Riemann VFI re, uh, invariant, which is actually a lot more complicated, look at this. It's a lot more complicated, and then, well, a, a lot, not a lot more complicated, but it's more complicated. Whereas in this case, it's actually a lot, it's, it's very simple. So the Riemannian distance between, uh, in this case, it's just equal to um, the Frobenius norm of log A minus log B. So it's a, it's a simple formulation. Now it has, um, it's a lot faster to compute uh, when uh, on a very large set of matrices because, uh, so in order to compute this distance, we need to have, we need to compute like an SPD. If we, if we want to compute a log function, we need to compute an SPD. And then so the, the computation of complexity is O and Q. But the, the advantage compared to the affine invariant distance is actually, if we have a set of, a large set of N uh, SPD matrices and we want to compute all the pairwise distances between these um, uh, matrices, then we just need to compute this log AI minus log HA. Now the, the key feature here is actually AI and HA are uncoupled. So we, uh, we can compute like for example, the log of all of the AI at the same, at first, and then we can, we can compute the distance uh, later on. So we can do everything in parallel. So it can be actually computed much faster when we have a very large set uh, of, of, of matrix because the computation of complexity is O n times n cube. So it's n time, it can be n times faster than, uh, than the affine invariance distance. So this is actually one of the, one of the motivation for the use of this log Euclidean distance because actually it's uh, computationally, it's, it's faster to compute than the affine invariant distance. Okay, now I won't, I won't go over this briefly, but I, it has a, under this log Euclidean metric, actually the, the set of SPD matrix actually has a very nice, uh, it has a very nice structure because it, it turns out that it's actually a vector space. So Arsenio introduced this um, group operation, they call it Lee group operation here. It's actually a, a commutative matrix multiplication. Now in, uh, if we multiply uh, two SPD matrix A and B together using the usual matrix multiplication, then the resulting matrix A, B is no longer, is in general, no longer symmetric. So it's not, it doesn't preserve symmetry. Whereas if we define by exponential of log A plus log B, um, then this operation here, this uh, O dot here, is, uh, is a multiplicative operation because we actually, we, we have um, the matrix A, O dot B, it's actually the same, it's, it's the same as B, O dot A, and it's a symmetric positive definite. So it preserves symmetry as well. So, um, so the Lovacolid metric is actually something, so they call it a, a, it's a, a bi-invariant Riemannian metric, and in a very simple way, we can think about this, like if we transform A and B by this operation here, uh, then uh, the distance remains the same. Now, bi-invariance actually has, a, has, has an abstract definition, but uh, we will not talk about it here, but in this setting, it means uh, uh, this uh, very simple um, transformation actually preserves the distance. Now, they, al they also introduced a scalar operation, um, so we have this, um, it's one of like um, we have lambda, a, a to the power lambda, or exponential of lambda log A here. Now with this operation, the uh, uh, C plus plus N is actually a vector space with the O dot being the used as vector addition and this, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how to say this operation here, star here acting as scalar multiplication. So it's actually a vector space at the two very special uh, operations. And so it's a vector space, it's actually flat. It's actually a flat, uh, so it's a, it's a remaining manifold with, uh, with zero curvature. And actually it's kind of isomorphic to the, the, uh, uh, to the set of, uh, um, to the vector space of CMAN, symmetric matrices under the standard matrix multiplication, uh, uh, standard matrix addition and scalar multiplication. So basically it's, a, it's um, as I said before, it's a flat, it's a log uh, operation. It's kind of flattens the manifold. Um, however, it's not this vector space. It's a very special vector space. It's not a subspace of Euclidean space because of this uh, two operation dot and, and star here. It's not a it's not a subspace of vector space. Now, Arseniedo was also uh, was talking just about the vector space, but it actually it also has an inner product structure, and this was. Um, uh, this was actually defined by, in, in ICC in 2013 by Lee et al. But they defined the, the inner product of A and B by log A, the inner, the Frobenius inner product of log A and log B. And uh, the Euclidean, log Euclidean norm of A by simply the, uh, the Frobenius norm of log of A. 
So with this, um, the set of the simplest n with these two operations dot and star and this inner product becomes an inner product space. And so we have the local distance, which is just the kind of the inner product distance and under this uh, under this inner product. And since uh, this is an inner product, we can actually define uh, it's an inner product space. So we can define like positive, many positive definite kernels on this space. So we can define the the, uh, the polynomial kernels on the polynomial kernels on this space, just um, polynomial of log a log b plus c to the power d, where d is uh, any natural numbers. And we can define the Gaussian and Gaussian-like kernel. So the exponential of negative one over sigma square log a minus log b to the power p, where p is between zero and, and two. So p here can, here, here can be between zero and two, actually. So with two, we have the Gaussian kernel. And with um, p is the, um, equal to one, we have something called the Laplace kernel. So because, uh, so this has to do with the, the fact that it's actually uh, the log uh, and under the log metric, we actually have uh, an inner product space. Now this, uh, so, so the, um, so that is the view of the lower Euclidean metric as a Riemannian metric, so it's a Riemannian metric, but it can also be viewed as, uh, as an approximation of the affine invariant uh, Riemannian distance. And we were talking uh, about like the kind of the, the exponential math for the affine invariant metric and so on. So this, it can be computed explicitly. It has this uh, the following form and it has a, so it maps a tangent space, which is a seam M to, to SPD matrices and it has an inverse log P that it maps, um, that basically it flattens the manifold. It maps uh, C plus plus N to the whole, uh, to the tangent split from the CI here should be PP. So in particular at the, uh, uh, so these are very complicated formulas, but at the identity matrix I, we actually have the exponential map at uh, I of V, it's actually just equal to exponential map of V. It's the matrix exponential and the, uh, the logarithm map at the, the identity matrix I just equal to log A. So it actually becomes very simple at the identity matrix A. And now if we look at the, um, so, th so these are the exponential map for the, for the affine uh, invariant uh, Riemannian metric and the, um, and the log map as well. Now in particular, if we, uh, if we recall that we were talking about the affine invariant metric uh, on the tangent space PP is given by the formula over there. So in particular at the, at the tangent space at the identity matrix I, so the VWI just equal to the, uh, the Frobenius uh, in the product of V and W and the distance of V and W, which is the, the Frobenius distance between V and W. So we can see that actually log of A minus log of BF is just e equal to the log of I A minus log of I B. So the Euclidean distance, which is on the left-hand side here, is actually just the, um, the distance of the um, if we project, if we project A and B onto the tangent space at, at the identity matrix uh, Ti, and we compute the uh, the distance there, then we obtain the log Euclidean distance. So, so the log Euclidean distance can be uh, can be considered as an approximation of the affine invariant Riemannian distance. And uh, this is uh, the second interpretation. So this uh, this is actually the interpretation that has been used a lot in the literature, but um, it does not really capture the kind of the extrinsic, uh, the extrinsic nature of the uh, the log Euclidean metric. So it's kind of it, it's not a complete uh, it's not a complete viewpoint. Okay. Okay. Now, so we. we now, but the the Euclidean metric is actually is a, well, we know that it's flat, and we were talking about the local Euclidean. Uh, uh, so this uh, set C plus plus n under the, the under the local Euclidean metric is also a manifold with uh, flat uh, with zero curvature, so it's also flat. But these are and it's also a vector space as well. But these are actually quite different. Um, these are two different two very different metrics. So they are. Um, and the difference is actually sometimes it's hard to see, but we can actually see it by the, by the invariance properties. So now they, they both satisfy this uh, uh, basically orthogonal invariance because if we transform them both, uh, A and B both by CIC inverse and CBC inverse, then the, the Euclidean distance remains the same and the log Euclidean distance also remains uh, the same. So they, are both, uh, satis they both satisfy the, this property. But nevertheless, um, the lower Euclidean distance is actually scale invariant because if you scale A and B by the same, by the same factor S, then uh, we, have, we have log S A minus log S B, so the, the S will actually cancel out. 
And so we just have log weight minus log weight. So it stays the same, whereas uh, the Euclidean distance is not scale invariant, obviously, because we just multiply the distance by, by the same factor s. And uh, so that is uh, one thing, what, what, one, one uh, property where they are different. And then the, the lower Euclidean distance is also inversion invariant. So we have, uh, if we invert both A and B, then the distance between A inverse, uh, A inverse and B inverse is actually the same because um, because we have the log of A inverse and minus log of B inverse is actually the same as uh, log A minus log B. So it stays the same, whereas the Euclidean distance is obviously not inversion invariant. So this is the second property where they are different. And asymmetric space, because now the, uh, the SPD, uh, the, the, the simplest, I don't know, the, the Euclidean distance is incomplete. We talked about it before, but uh, uh, under the log Euclidean metric, because it's actually it's, an, it's a, it's a finite dimension, it's a finite dimension in the product space. So it's actually a complete, uh, it's a complete metric space. So that's the, so this is the third property where they are different. So basically, basically they're actually quite different even though they are both uh, manifolds with zero curvature, but they're actually quite different. And uh, so they have different, um, you know, they have different invariance properties and the Euclidean metric is actually a x extrinsic to C plus plus n, whereas the log Euclidean metric is actually in, in intrinsic to C plus plus n. So those are the two uh, manifold viewpoints of the set of SPD matrices. The first one is the affine invariant Riemannian metric, and the second one is the log Euclidean metric you know, with uh, a few different interpretations. Now, the third one uh, is uh, we talk about the set of SPD matrix as a convex cone of the Brickman divergences. So these are these are not um, these are not Riemannian matrix, but they're actually um, they're actually quite closely related. So this actually starts from a very different viewpoint. It doesn't talk about the, the manifold structure at all. It actually starts from the convex structure. So um, uh, Breckman uh, in 1967, uh, 1967 defined this uh, Breckman divergence on a convex, on a convex uh, subset of Rn using a, a strictly convex function of phi. So we define like B phi xy equal to phi x minus phi y uh, minus uh, kind of the, um, the gradient, what's the gradient? I'm sorry, 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 this will be the gradient, sorry, I made a mistake. X minus Y, then we have, um, then it's actually divergence in the sense that uh, it's always greater than or equal to zero and it's equal to zero if and only if X is equal to Y. Now, in, in general, actually, we can define a very general um, family of divergence um, parameterized by a parameter alpha given by this formula here. And the limiting case is actually, so where alpha lies between uh, negative one and one, and actually it can be generalized to alpha lying outside negative one and one as well, but I won't talk about uh, alpha just lying between negative one and one. So the limiting case actually when alpha goes to one, then we have the, the Bregman divergence of X and Y, and when alpha goes to negative one, then we have the divergence of, Bregman divergence of Y and X. Now if we apply this, if we apply this to the, uh, to the negative log that function, um, then we have something we call the alpha log determinant divergences. Uh, so it's given by this formula here. So d alpha log that of a and b is equal to four over one minus alpha square log of log that of one minus alpha over two a plus one plus alpha over two b, divide, dividing by that of uh, a one minus alpha over two that b one plus alpha over two. So we have seen this before actually. When alpha is equal to zero, you have this asymmetric Stein divergence. Uh, this is one alpha equal to zero, but this family is actually very general. So the limiting case, we can actually take the, this is one alpha is between negative one and one, and we can take the limiting, the case is one alpha goes to one. Uh, we have something called, we call the, uh, the Berg divergence, how people also call it the, the, uh, the jensen breckmann log dead divergence, the choice of A inverse, um, choice of B inverse um, times A minus I minus of B inverse A, and then, the, uh, the uh, when alpha goes to negative one, we have like, just the, the kind of the, the divergence between B and A. Actually. So this is actually a general. Uh, so alpha here can be used uh, as a para, as a kind of um, alpha is a parameter uh, as a parameter. It can be used as a basically a parameter in an algorithm as well. So in the in the case where alpha is equal to zero, this is all called the symmetric style divergence, also called the, also called the S divergence. Now uh, in Sha in 2012 actually showed what well, he was actually, um, 
He actually saw, he, he kind of didn't consider like the, the general formula here. Actually, he just consider it. Basically, he, he, what he considered is actually one, one fourth of this uh, formula. So he, cons um, con he considered like log of A plus B over two minus a half log of, uh, log of AB. So this formula is actually a very famous formula. So Stra in 2012 showed that this is actually the square root of this quantity is actually a metric. So it's, it's positive and it's symmetric and it satisfies the triangle inequality. But it, as I said, it's actually that's a very that's a very general formula. Um, it's a family. It's a family of divergences. So in general, they are it's greater than or equal to zero and it's equal to zero when a is equal to b. But it's not it's not symmetric. In general, it's not symmetric. And as I said, they are not they're not metrics. So in general, we don't have the triangle inequality. But they are actually very close related to uh, they are very closely related to the affine invariant metric because actually they are affine invariant. We transform them by the same affine transformation and they remain the same. And uh, it's scale invariant. And so you need the reinvariants in the special uh, cases of the phi invariants. So these can be verified. And it satisfies something we call the dual symmetry. So log that of uh, alpha uh, of uh, AB is equal to log that of negative alpha of BA. In particular, in the case when alpha is equal to zero, then it's symmetric. So this is the case of the symmetric uh, Stein diversion. So it's symmetric only uh, if and only if alpha is equal to zero. And it satisfies dual invariance. So if we transform uh, log that, uh, if we transform A and B by A inverse B inverse, then we have to uh, to um, negate uh, negate alpha as well. So in particular, when alpha is equal to zero, it's invariant uh, under inversion. So it's uh, it's invariant under inversion if and only alpha is equal to zero. This is the case of the the um, the affine uh, uh, the, the the symmetric Stein divergence. So it's actually quite close. This uh, quantity here is actually closely related to the something called the Rennie divergences between probability measures in uh, in Rn. Um, so it's given by this formula here: dr of p1 and p2. Uh, we have two uh, probability distributions on Rn. So given by that formula here: negative one over one minus r log of this um, integral. And when alpha is equal, uh, when r goes, to, this is like the the Rennie divergence of order r. And when R goes to one, we actually have something called the, the Grunbeck uh, Leibler divergence. And so this uh, uh, log that divergence is actually closely connected to this uh, formula because when, I, when we have two Gaussian density functions with the same with the same mean, then um, we have uh, they actually related by the formula over that just different by uh, by a constant basically. And uh, in particular, in the case when r is equal to one, then the um, the log that uh, the the d log that at, uh, or when r is equal to one is actually equal to twice the, the KR divergence between p one and p two. So they are actually very closely uh, connected to each other. So that is the case of the uh, the alpha log that divergences. So they actually uh, they can be computed using the log that function. So we, we, in order to compute the, the, the alpha log uh, determinant divergence, we need to compute the, the log that function, and this can be computed using the Cholesky decomposition. So it, now it's actually the computational complexity is also O n cube. It's actually faster, like the, uh, it's actually a lot faster than, than the computation of the, uh, the affine variant metric. Even though like in, in, in theoretically, it's actually O three. And um, so it's actually uh, because of actually here we don't need to compute. We just need to compute the matrix addition of A and B, and then the the Cholesky decomposition. So we need only need to compute matrix inversion. We don't need to compute matrix multiplication. So it, in general, it's actually a lot faster than the affine variant metric. So it actually belongs to a very general. So both the um, this alpha log that divergence actually is a case of um, it's a special case of a very general uh, family of divergences, and. Um, so it's defined by this formula here: d alpha a b, one of the alpha log that of alpha a b inverse one to the power of beta plus plus beta a b inverse one to the power of alpha over a plus alpha, where alpha and beta are both greater than zero, or they can be both less than zero as well. So it's it's actually a very general uh, family of divergences because it encompasses both the mm, it's a fine invariant. So they are they are a fine invariant, and it encompasses many different uh, divergences and differences on spin plus plus n. So in particular, it encompasses the, uh, the alpha log that divergence that I talked about before, including this, the symmetric Stein divergence. 
And the square root of this, the D alpha in the case of an A and B uh, alpha and beta are the same, and the square root is actually a metric. In particular, it, it, in, uh, when alpha is equal to a half, and we recover the, uh, the symmetric Stein divergence. And it also uh, encompasses um, the, the alpha invariant Riemannian distance. So it's actually, it's, uh, so it encompasses actually the, both the, um, the alpha log net divergence and the alpha invariant uh, distance. And actually it can be shown that it induces uh, um, a Riemannian metric on this set of SPD metrics, which is precisely the alpha invariant metric. I will not talk about that, but it's actually, it has, it has a, a, a very, very general interpretation. So this alpha in particular, uh, some, so, so some work actually has kind of started using this uh, alpha as a parameter for kind of uh, in the algorithms, but it has not been used so much yet. So in order to compute this distance, um, so this actually this has not been used uh, too much in practice. So to, com to compute this, in general, we need to compute like the eigenvalues of AB inverse one. And so we need to compute like the, uh, basically, um, so, it takes time with O and Q, so it has the same computational complexity as the, the alpha invariant uh, Riemannian distance. So it's, it's not, a, in general, it's not a cheap, uh, it's also a, an expensive um, divergence to compute. But it's a very general divergence. Now there's one more, so it doesn't, it, 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 uh, so it includes the alpha invariant uh, Riemannian distance and the uh, symmetric style divergence and the, the log, uh, alpha log determinant divergence, but it does not include the, the, um, the um, log Euclidean distance. So it's actually, there's some uh, family called the power Euclidean distances. It was um, introduced by uh, Dridden et al. in 2009. So it's given by, we have a parameter alpha here, and the E of alpha AB, just the uh, one of alpha and then the Frobenius distance, the distance between A alpha and, and B to the power alpha. So when alpha is equal to one, we obtain the, the Euclidean distance of alpha is equal to, go to zero, we actually obtain the, the log Euclidean distance between, uh, between A and B. So it's a family, it's a, another generalization that involves, um, it's a different family of, uh, of, of distances that include the log Euclidean distance, uh, log Euclidean distance as a special case. Now this is not, um, it's, it does not, however, share the same invariance properties as the log Euclidean distance because it's not scale invariant or it's not, it's not inversion invariant. So this one have also been, uh, this distance has been used recently, I think, uh, uh, by, some, by, some, by, some, um, by some group, but it has not been used so much. So, okay, so, okay, so I have finished talking about the distance and divergences. So we talk about the log Euclidean, the, the Euclidean distance and the alpha invariant Riemannian distance. We talk about the log Euclidean distance and the different divergences, the alpha uh, log determinant divergences and the alpha beta log determinant divergences. So there are a lot of different divergences one can use and also the power Euclidean distances. So this is like a summary of the, of the most common, uh, commonly used distances and divergences. Okay, I wouldn't just, uh, so there actually there has been a lot of work recently on, on different learning methods in, in machine learning methods and covariance matrices. We are, there are um, a lot of papers on sparse coding and dictionary learning. There are, uh, there's work on metric learning, on dimensionality reduction, uh, and also on optimization. So I will talk, I will briefly uh, talk about the kernel methods on, on covariance matrices. Now, if we have, uh, we, if we use the Euclidean metric, then we can define, like, um, sim uh, I'm going to talk about kernel, kernel methods, actually. If we have the, um, the, the Euclidean metric, then we can de simply define a positive definite kernel using the uh, the, uh, the, the, the provenance in the product and norms, so we can define KAB by the trace of A transpose B plus C for D, the polynomial kernels, and we can also define the Gaussian kernels, Gaussian-like kernels. So this is, these are very simple to compute, and as I said, we can compute like the, the kernels using the log Euclidean metric as well, using the log Euclidean in the product and the norm. So we also have the polynomial kernels instead of, uh, instead of A, uh, the inner product of A and B, we use the log Euclidean inner product of A and B, 
and the same for the Gaussian and the Gaussian light kernels. So of course, it's a second one is a is more com more computationally intensive than the first one, but it tends to be it tends to perform a lot better in practice. And for the Stein divergence, uh, so uh, Shra, uh, Shra showed that we can also compute like a Gaussian like a Gaussian kernel using this distance, using uh, the, this divergence. I'm sorry. Uh, on a particular set of uh, parameters, sigma, so sigma has to satisfy like a very, um, so, uh, uh, has to have a specific range of uh, parameter value. And so one has to be careful if one uses uh, when fine tuning sigma so that the kernel remains positive definite. So, of course, now one thing about whether one can actually compute the Gaussian kernel using the affine variant Riemannian distance. But it's actually, it's not, in general, it's actually not, um, not possible, actually. It cannot be positive definite for all sigma greater than zero because uh, the manifold actually has non-positive curvature. And Farragan et al. actually showed in CVPR 2015 that actually the manifold has to be flat if we, we want this to, to happen. So it cannot be positive definite for all sigma greater than zero. Now, it, uh, whether it uh, can be positive definite for some specific choices of sigma is not, is not known because, um, so we, we don't have anything, uh, we don't have a, a, a result which is, uh, a result which is um, kind of similar to this, uh, to this result here. So this case actually is not, it's, it's, a far from, it's far from trivial. So I'm just listing some of the work here that has um, employed, uh, employed this, um, the kernel methods with the Lopper-Kalidian metric. So this is actually the, um, so this is like the schematic diagram of this, uh, of this method on, for image classification. We, had a, we start with some images and we extract features and we can compute uh, the covariance metrics of these uh, features and then we can compute the Lopper-Kalidian inner product or distance uh, between these covariance matrices and then we can, we have a distance matrix then we can compute a kernel on top of this distance matrix and then we can apply um, SVB classification. So this is a schematic diagram of this, uh, of this method. Basically, it was um, a schematic diagram of them, of these, uh, of these, um, of this work. So basically, it's, it's, it's a kernel method on, on the Riemannian manifold of SPD matrices using the lot Euclidean metric, because as I said, with the lot Euclidean metric, we can define positive definite kernels. So the, uh, the, the decision boundary will lie on the manifold itself. So these are some of the, uh, some of the, exa some of the numerical results. So we, uh, I'm just uh, showing some, some examples, some very simple examples. This is a kind of KTH deep data set of materials classification. So we, uh, this is, in this we just have the, uh, the red, green, and blue colors, and then the, the GABO filter responses. And this is an example uh, using the ETH uh, data set for um, check recognition. So I'm just, I'm just uh, showing some examples here. This is like, uh, okay, there will be a lot, the results will be actually a lot better using the covariance operators in, in part two. Here we just have, you can just compare like uh, between the, uh, the Euclidean distance and for example, the, the non-Euclidean distance, you can see that with E and log E, for example, the, the difference is actually quite large. So uh, it's, an indication of the uh, the suboptimality of the uh, the Euclidean metric because we, when the uh, kind of the non-Euclidean uh, structure is not taken into account, so the charm is actually quite large here. And so now there has not been so much work comparing the different metrics. I'm just citing one uh, set of results from Cherry et al. in Palmi 2013 using nearest neighbor on where they were compa uh, computing like. Um, where they were actually compare different uh, different metrics, so the affine variant distance and the uh, basically the, um, the, the the metric associated with the symmetric Stein divergence and the Lotwakalidian distance. Now you can see actually with the um, the both the affine variant uh, Riemannian distance and the Stein divergence actually perform in a very similar way because they they both satisfy affine variant properties, and they are they are slightly better than the Lotwakalidian distance, which does not satisfy the affine variant property. So they, they carry out this on like two active two um, two task texture and activities. But in general, actually, there has not been like an extensive uh, yet comparison of of the different distances and and, and divergence. As I said, actually, there are there are just so many of them now. That it's, um, it's it's yeah, it's not it's not yet clear um, in general. Um, 
we don't have we don't have like a very extensive comparison yet. I think I'm finishing on time. Uh, way too early actually. So um, I think I'm coming to a close. So I have talked about um, the data representation by covariance matrices, and we talked about the, the geometry of SPD matrices, and we talked a little bit about kernel methods on, on covariance matrices. Okay, just a set of references. I should have finished. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Um, I'm done with part one. Any questions? Any uh, questions or comments or suggestions? <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, which one? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, this is a, this is a, uh, this actually this is a complete space because it's actually it's a Hilbert space. Actually, under so under this um, under this log Euclidean metric, this set of SPD metrics actually becomes a, a complete uh, inner product space. So it's not the Euclidean metric. So in the, if we talk about this set as a, as an Euclidean metric, then it's not it's not a complete uh, metric space. But under the lab of metric, it's a complete metric space. Actually, it's a, it's a Hilbert space, it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So actually, it's, it's complete. And it's an inner product, actually. So, so I, we can define kernels. That's, what, that's how we can define kernels. Not, not with the affine variant distance, because with the affine variant distance, we, don't, we, cannot, mm, we cannot define, um, we can, uh, for example, okay, also with the Stein divergence as well, as, uh, as uh, Sarah showed uh, here, we actually we have a very spe a specific set of sigma for which the kernel is positive definite. So it's, uh, it cannot be true for all sigma, only a very specific set of sigma. And for the affine variant reminding distance, no. But we don't know whether it's possible to define positive, defin positive definite kernel for some choices of sigma. It's only with the log Euclidean metric and the, and the Euclidean metric. On the tangents, on the tangent space, yeah. Uh, you can define p norm, yeah. Uh, that's the name for it. Actually, I forgot. What is it? I forgot. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a Riemannian manifold. Actually, when you define like the. P when you find a phenom, it's not a Riemannian manifold. It's, it's more general. It has a name. Uh, I, I forgot about it now, but it has, it has a name. It has a mathematical name. Somebody might know it. I, I forgot the name just now. Yeah, but it, it can be more general than that. It doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be the, um, like the Frobenius uh, distance. It can be a norm. It can be any. It, it can be like P norm. I'm sorry? Say again, please. Oh, here, but manifold is actually I will talk about in the next section. It's when it's infinite dimensional. I will talk about it in part two, when it's infinite dimensional. Because in this case, actually, it's locally finite dimensional, so it's locally Euclidean. But when it's infinite dimensional, then it's, it's a Hilbert norm. But he, he's talking about the P norm, where it doesn't have to be like the, because for me, this norm is actually kind of the, the two norm, basically. He's talking about the P norm. It, ha it has, um, it has a name. I, I forgot. I, I, I won't think about it <laughs> later. Yeah? Say again, please. Okay. If you, if you, uh, uh, 
of the beta, you, you just get a different family. Uh, okay, I don't have an interpretation, but you, you get like a family of divergences uh, for sure. But I, I, I don't have, uh, I don't have, uh, um, I don't have an interpretation for it at the moment. I, I, I'm not aware of it. So thank you for the question. It's a very interesting question. As I said again, actually this um, this has not been uh, used so much in practice. I have I have actually seen some work, uh, but not not yet, not so much yet. It has the same computational complexity as the affine uh, invariant distance, so it's, it's in general it's actually quite it's quite expensive to compute as well. But these actually have uh, I mean these actually have all been generalized to the to the infinite dimensional setting. So I would I would not I would not I wouldn't talk about some of these uh, in the in the second part of the talk. But this is like the, um, um, in the, uh, the finite dimension, there's things so I think many of you have seen um, almost everything already. So there's nothing, there's nothing um, really new here. Okay, so it's only 10 o'clock. Um, so we, so we stop here and then come back later on. If there are if there are no more questions, then we can stop here and we can we can come back after the coffee break. Or should I continue part two immediately? <laughs> okay, let's have a coffee break. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. No, please, yeah, please. Oh, oh can, can you come closer here, please? Because I cannot really hear you very well from the back. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, the scale, the scale. Oh, okay. But how, how are you deforming it? How are you deforming it? So there are three forms. It's a three form that is I know what you mean. It's, it's a little bit. It's a little bit different, yeah. Because you you, you want you want a, a quotient actually. You want a quotient, yeah. yeah, of the transformation. Yeah, it's a little bit different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you want to, you want. I think you want to do something with the quotient of the transformation. Yeah. The transformation group, yeah. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit more complicated. Yeah, well, it's actually a lot more complicated. <laughs> yeah. I think you can do it in general, actually, if you have a, a group of transformation. But, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have an, like a, an explicit answer for you, of course, but, uh, but in general, it's actually the idea of the using the quotient, yeah. the quotient of the transformation. Very interesting. Thank you. Any more questions? So then we, are, we can go for the coffee break. Thank you. Hope to see you again in part two. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, I, I went put the slides on the on the website actually, because I have a that's a website for this. I, I went put that was that's a website for the tutorial. I went put the slides up on there, and I wouldn't I would add like more references as well. So, okay. Also, we we are publishing a we are publishing a book, so it should be, yeah, like uh, we actually uh, we are so a lot of the material actually found in the in the book as well. So. Conference as a computer vision machine learning, but there's a website for the. Yeah. yeah. So some people have. Yeah. So yes, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's very. I think it's very interesting. Though. I think it's with the three D. Yeah, with the three D background. So I think it's a lot. It's a very interesting. They use like geometric features as well, so, so it's very, it's more interesting than the two dimension. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. start again. Um, hello everyone again. Thank you for coming back. Um, I hope I didn't <laughs> bore you during the first part of the talk. So I will, I will start now with the second, uh, with the second half of the, of the presentation. Uh, this one is going to be on the finite dimensional, uh, the infinite dimensional generalization of the, uh, the covariance matrix, is namely covariance uh, operators. So from finite to infinite dimensions. Now, so uh, uh, let's recall that we were talking about covariance matrix is an application to the, the data representation by Covariance matrices, and we talk about the, the geometry of SPD matrices with the different uh, distances and divergences, and we talk about kernel methods on covariance matrices. So um, now, in the in the same way, I would I would talk about the covariance operators and applications, and uh, so in the same basic kind of the same format with the data representation uh, data representations by covariance operators, and we talk about the geometry of the operators. And then also like some machine learning methods on covariance operators. Now, but this, um, the infinite dimensional theory is a lot more, it's still undergoing development, so there's still a lot of work going on. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually much more recent than the, than the, uh, the finite dimensional part. So, okay, so here we were talking, uh, one of the most important features of this is actually we were talking about the set of SPD matrices as a, as a Riemannian manifold, it was a finite dimensional Riemannian manifold, and uh, in the, from a geometrical viewpoint in this uh, part of the talk, we were talking about, about an infinite dimensional Riemannian manifold. So from a mathematical viewpoint, actually this is mathematically quite recent. Unlike the, um, in the case of SPD matrices, like the, the mathematical theory actually kind of went back as, as far as uh, 1940, uh, 1944 with the work of Seeger. In the infinite dimensional setting, actually this is much more recent. So um, like in the, the year 2000 actually. Okay. So, so the motivation for covariance operator representation from uh, 
from the governance matrix representation is that when we use a governance matrix for representation, they encode the linear correlations of input features. Now we want to do, uh, we want to generalize it to the nonlinear setting. So we want to, we want to do this um, by um, mapping the original input features instead of computing the covariance matrix of uh, the original input features directly. What we want to do is we want to map the original input features into a high dimensional feature space. Uh, generally an infinite dimensional uh, feature space. This is, uh, uh, one way to do it is actually via a Gurner method, uh, a positive definite Gurners. And then we can compute the covariance matrix of uh, infinite dimensional uh, features. So these are, uh, we call it covariance operators. Uh, and so these, um, because this, uh, this uh, feature maps have to be quite highly nonlinear, they have to be highly nonlinear if you want to map into a high dimensional space. So then, uh, these covariance operators capture the nonlinear correla uh, correlations between the input features. So they provide a richer and more powerful representation of, uh, of the data compared to, to the covariance matrices. Now, they wouldn't come with a higher computation, of course, and we won't talk about that. So um, let me mention some of the work. Uh, on this covariance uh, operator, operator representation in the use in computer vision. So it was actually done like in uh, from a while ago by Joe and Jalapa, they were doing this for pro for probabilistic distance measures in, in reproducing corneal structures in Palmy 2006 and Haranti and uh, uh, Mathieu Sazman and Fatih Borikli was doing co uh, kind of infinite dimensional covariance matrices in, Aplia in computer vision using the Bregman divergence in CVPR 2014. And then in our group we were doing this uh, we generalize the log occluded distance to something we call the log Hilbert Schmidt matrix uh, uh, in NIST 2014, and then we were doing an approximation version of this in CPPR 2016. We have been actually working on the log determinant divergences as well. It actually, a much more general direction. Some of it is actually still under, uh, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, we're still undergoing, um, undergoing development. So I will, I will mention some of the work on the log determinant divergences uh, uh, later on. So let's first talk about, so we, we do, we do, we, we carry out this generalization via, from covariance matrices to covariance operators via positive definite kernels. So let's have a brief overview of the, kind of the formal definition of positive definite kernels. So suppose we have, oh, this is uh, probably not new anymore. There's a, uh, suppose we have any um, ample set X and a uh, positive definite kernel on X, which is a symmetric function, so that we have uh, the summation I, J from one to n, where I H A K X I J is always greater than or equal to zero for any set of points X in X and J numbers A I. So in particular, this means that the if we have a matrix K X I X J, um, um, the entry what the I J entries are K X I X J, then this is a symmetric positive semi-definite. So this is the formal definition of a positive definite kernel, and uh, so this is actually this is well known in the machine learning and computer vision. So if we have a if we have a positive definite kernel, then we can define a, a space of function on on this set x as follow for any x we have any x and x we have a function kx is, uh, is indexed by x it's defined by kxt is equal to just kxt and then we can define the set of all in the combinations of this uh, function so we, uh, the summation of ai kxi and then we can define an inner product used on this um, on this uh, set, and then we take the kind of basically like the, the closure of this set. Uh, so we, we obtain something we call the reproducing kernel here plus HK associated with, uh, with K. So this is a, a unique correspondence. Given the kernel, we have a, a reproducing kernel or RKHS um, of functions uh, on X. So there's a unique uh, correspond, uh, correspondence. And um, so the reproducing property it's called reproducing Gaussian number space because we have the reproducing property. It says that for every f, we have fx equal to k, the inner product of f of k. So we have the, the value of fx uh, at every point is, is well defined. So this is also like classical mathematics and the abstract theory was due to Aaron Sachin in 1950, but it was actually kind of uh, started actually um, even before that in the 1920s as well. So of course it has numerous applications in machine learning in, in, in the form of kernel methods. So in this work, uh, in, in what we are in this talk, we are talking. We are using um, kind of the feature map associated with uh, with this. Okay, so, so for the for the record, I actually did my PhD in reproducing kernel here in plus space in, in learning theory. So this is kind of uh, my former background actually. 
So, okay, so got, this is a very well known. Then we have the Gaussian kernel, the Laplace kernel, and so on. This is a very well known. So what we are going to use here is we use the feature map associated with, uh, with the kernel. So given a, a positive definition of kernel K, we have, like, uh, the geometric viewpoint of, of this kernel is actually, it, it maps um, the input space X into, a, into the, um, a feature space. In this case, we have HK, we can map, like, every X, we can map it to, um, to the function K, to Fx equal Cx equal to Kx. Yeah, so Kx now is, um, is in, the, in, in the Hilbert space um, HK. So it's called the feature space. And with the property that the inner product of Cx and Cy is precisely equal to Kxy. So this leads to the, um, the kernelization, the, the kernel trick in, in, in machine learning, where if we have a, a linear algorithm that depends on the inner product of x and y and rn, then we, if we replace this inner product with the kernel uh, Kxy, then we have a nonlinear algorithm. So this is actually a very powerful uh, uh, a very powerful geometric viewpoint uh, from machine learning and pattern recognition. As this is not a view, it was actually pretty uh, uh, very nice uh, viewpoint as well. So we are going to use this now. Remember that in the covariance uh, the definition of covariance matrix, we have a, a, probability, a probability distribution with a second finite second moment, where the uh, um, the integral of uh, the norm of x square uh, rho is less than infinity. Then we can define a mean vector, which is the expectation of the, or the average of X. And then we can define the covariance matrix, which is the expectation of the second moment. Now, if we replace, now, if instead of X here, we replace it with phi X, which has mapped X to phi X, which has replaced X by phi X. So we, instead of uh, requiring the, the, the norm of the integral of the norm of X squared is less than infinity, we require that the integral of the phi X, the norm of phi X squared is less than infinity. By the reproducing property, this is just the, the integral of KX X is less than infinity. Now, for the Gaussian kernel, this is uh, true because of the Gaussian kernel, Kx is always equal to one. So then we can define a mean vector, which is like the expectation, just simply the expectation of this, uh, of this feature, uh, phi x. So instead of x, we just, we just use the map phi, and we compute the, inter the expectation of phi x. So for the, um, and it has, the proper, it has the property that actually if we take the inner product of um, mu of phi, which is uh, the mean vector here with any function f in HK, then we just have the expectation of the function, uh, of the function f. And the same, we, we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing for the, um, uh, for the, for the covariance operator. Instead of, instead of taking the, uh, um, the expectation of, of x minus mu, which is uh, and, um, time x minus mu transpose, this, uh, product here is actually it's just a generalization of just the transpose. Then we can we just take phi, we just take uh, we just map using the map phi. Then we have the covariance operator. So just think about this phi x minus mu with the tensor product of phi x minus mu as phi x minus mu times phi x minus mu transpose. And it has the property that if we if the inner product of f and c c c g is just equal to the expectation of fg minus expectation of F, f times expectation of g. So basically it's just the directionalization of this, the covariance matrix with, uh, with x replaced by x replaced by phi x. Now the phi x here in, is in general, is in general implicit. It's actually not computed explicitly. It can be computed explicitly. Actually there are, uh, but it, the, the, uh, the, um, the expressions tend to be quite complicated actually. So in general it's actually used uh, implicitly. Now, that is, that is the theoretical uh, um, definition that we want to compute the empirical, uh, the empirical means and the empirical covariance um, uh, matrix. If we have like a data matrix as before, if we have a data matrix of, with n um, uh, sample from, from the probability distribution row with m observations, then if we map, uh, if we have the map phi, if we map the phi to x and we have an like informally, we can think about this as an infinite, uh, infinite um, feature matrix, basically. We just map uh, phi x is equal to the, um, the matrix whose columns are just phi x1 up to phi x m. So it has like m columns, and the, the, you can think about the dimension of the, the size of each column as the, the dimension of the, the space hk. So this, I, this is an informal viewpoint, but it's actually, it can be, you can think about it in this way. Informally, it can be, 
if, if, if you want to have the formal definition, then it's a, it's a linear operator in the sense that it map, uh, it maps each point in, in RM into like a, a function in a, HK. So it's given by this formula here, PXW is equal to the summation of OWI PXI. But or I would prefer to, to think about it as a, as a feature matrix PX as written there with the M columns, PX1 up to PXM. So if we have this uh, feature matrix PX, then we can compute, with, okay, this is like a, the, the theoretical mean uh, mu is the expectation of the PX, and then we have the, the empirical mean, which is one over M times uh, the, the, the average of PXI, and it can be written as PX times one M, so the same as before, as before, just replaced X by, by PX. And the same for the, for the covariance, uh, for the covariance uh, operator, we just replaced, uh, we have the, we have the, the, the theoretical version there, and then we have uh, replaced the integral by the summation of, uh, uh, the summation, the average of the summation over, over M, of PXI minus uh, PX, uh, PXI minus mu. And so the, it can be written as one over M PX and JM PX. Uh, this is actually the, the HOI operator. It can be written, it can be considered the transpose. It's PX, uh, JM PX transpose. So it's the same as this for, uh, before we have like X times JM PX, uh, X, transpose and now we just have px and jm and px transpose so so that is the the covariance uh, operator representation so okay so it has some it's a uh, self adjoint which is symmetric this is a notation for, uh, it means symmetric it's positive now it has a trace it's a, a trace class operator in the sense that it has a set of countable set of eigenvalues so it has uh, in general it has infinitely many eigenvalues but the eigenvalues are all positive, and the summation of these eigenvalues is less than, uh, is, is finite. And the empirical, um, uh, of course the empirical uh, covariance is actually has finite rank. So it's, uh, it's an infinite matrix, but it has finitely many, many eigenvalues. So, okay, so that is the, uh, the covariance operator. Now, so the representation of the matrix by covariance operator is the same uh, is the generalization from the covariance matrix. So instead of, um, so given an, an image F, we have, um, as before, we, we extract a set of, uh, we extract like a feature vector as before. And so each image gives rise to a data matrix X as before. But now, instead of, uh, instead of computing the, the covariance matrix of, uh, of X, we compute, uh, we define a corner K, and so this corner K induces like a feature map phi, and we have the feature map uh, the feature matrix phi x. And so now each uh, image is represented by a covariance uh, operator C phi x, given by this formula. So it just replaces x by phi x. And now the difference is actually this uh, representation is, is in now, it's implicit because actually phi is implicit. It doesn't, uh, it's actually, it's not implicit. Now in the exact formulation, the computations are carried out by a, by a gram matrix of uh, Corresponding to uh, to the kernel, and it's not it's not computed explicitly in, in terms of the uh, the features in themselves, but um, we uh, to to do it efficiently. What we do is actually we we can uh, estimate it. We uh, can approximate it by explicit low dimensional approximation of phi. So in, in the approximation version, it wouldn't be explicit, but the implicit uh, the exact formulation is finite dimensional. Okay, so I will talk about like um, the geometry of covariance operators. Now, this may be um, okay. As I said before, it, it will be the infinite dimensional version is uh, is rather abstract, but actually everything everything actually ha can be computed and has has been applied in, in practice. Okay. So now, what we do first is actually we have so as before we have uh, three different viewpoints. The first viewpoint is kind of the generalization of the Galilean metric, and the second viewpoint is uh, that of the manifold. So we also have the generalization of the phi invariant metric and the generalization of the log Euclidean metric and we also have the convex, the, the convex viewpoint um, uh, with the log determinant divergences as well. But I, probably wouldn't, I will not talk about the, the convex cone because it's, uh, um, it's probably too much, uh, too much time. It requires too much time. So I want to talk about the first, the first two viewpoints.
So the Hilbert, uh, the Hilbert Schmidt metric is a generalization of the, the Frobenius um, uh, inner product and distance. So in the final dimensional case, we just have the, the inner product of F, A and B, just the trace of A transpose B, and we can compute the distance between A and B is the Frobenius, the Frobenius distance between um, A and B is the Galilean distance. Now in the uh, in the dimensional setting, now we assume that A and A and B are now are kind of infinite dimensional matrices. Like what we think about as infinite dimensional matrices, where mapping H to H, where H is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space with a countable orthonormal basis. So we can think about it as infinite ma infinite matrix and, and H is a like L square, the space of square sum of uh, um, sequences, and it's countable in the sense in, in, in it's countable in the sense of actually the it's, it has bound of knowledge. The super member of AX over mm -hmm. X is always less than infinity. It has a le less than a constant. And um, it's uh, the adjoint is basically just a transpose. And it's self adjoint when, uh, when A star is equal to A. So A star is actually just a transpose. So we can come, so the generalization is actually it's called the Hilbert Schmidt inner product. So instead of the, uh, the transpose of uh, A and B, the trace of A transpose B, we have the trace of uh, A star B, so A star is a transpose. It's now, so it's defined in terms of the orthonormal basis, it's, it's defined in terms of the summation of uh, EK, A transpose, uh, in the product of EK times e, uh, EK with um, A transpose B EK. So um, this is well defined, this is well defined, uh, only if uh, A and B lies in a particular set of operators, it's called the Hilbert Schmidt operators. And so the, with the Hilbert Schmidt norm of A square is defined by the, uh, by the trace of uh, A star A. So it's just a generalization, uh, generalization of the, the Frobenius, um, Frobenius um, norm. And it's equal to the summation of A, A uh, the, the norm of A E K square, where E K is any orthonormal basis. Now it can be shown that if uh, this is finite, then it has, it's the same for any uh, uh, orthonormal basis E K, so it's independent of the choice of orthonormal basis. So this is the generalization of the, the Frobenius in, in the product um, in the infinite dimensional setting because the Hilbert Schmidt in the product for Hilbert Schmidt operators. So we have a particular set of uh, operators on which this is well defined. And now if an operator A is Hilbert Schmidt, if this norm is finite, then it has to be compact in the sense that it has a set of, a countable set of eigenvalues lambda k, and actually this lambda k would have to go to infinity. In particular, if A is symmetric, it's self adjoint, then the, the Hilbert Schmidt norm square is just a summation of all the eigenvalue uh, square. So, in the, in the case of the Frobenius norm, it's just a summation of the k from 1 to n, and lambda k square. In this case, we just have an infinite number of, uh, number of eigenvalues. Now, in the case of uh, the covariance operators, you know, if we, we actually have explicit formulas for these, for these distances. For, for these norms and in the product and so on. So if we have, if we have like two random matrices um, before x and y, we represent like each image, uh, image one by x and image two by data matrix y. Then we can compute like the, um, the covariance matrix, uh, the covariance operator CPX, and the covariance uh, matrix CPY, a uh, covariance operator CPY. Then we uh, we can compute uh, we can compute like the the, the uh, Hilbert Schmidt distance between CPX and CPY in terms of the the gram matrices. Uh, so the gram matrices are defined by so KX for example is equal to uh, PX star CX. So this one is actually finite dimensional. It's an M by M matrix because so because phi is actually uh, uh, phi is um, M um, infinite uh, uh, is a dimension of HK times M and phi star is the dimension of uh, uh, HK, the dimension of, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Phi, Phi X is the dimension of, um, uh, uh, dimension of HK times M, and Phi star is dimension M times uh, HK. So when we, when we multiply Phi X star with Phi X, we actually have an M by M matrix. And the same for K, uh, KY and KXY. And so these are all M by M matrices. So, so these are the, the distance CPX and CPY actually can be computed by M by M, uh, as in through, through these gram matrices. And actually they have, it has an explicit formula. This actually, this is not hard to, um, to, to show that it has this formula. So it's because it's defined, okay, actually it's defined by the trace formula here. So when we multiply the trace of uh, A star with B, we, when we multiply these two, 
see a phi x and phi y together, we have like a phi, uh, the phi x star and then the, the phi y we multiply together. And so that's where the, the gram matrix is appear. Is it clear? Is it, is it, is it okay? So the distance is, I can be, um, the distance is CVX and CVY, the Hindu distance, ha has an explicit form in terms of the gram matrices, and also the, the, the inner product. So they can be computed explicitly. So even though, like, it's, if you did mention the distance, actually, it has, a, it has an explicit form uh, by uh, M by M matrices. So this can be computed and it can be used, uh, it can be used in practice for a uh, uh, particular application. So now the computation of complexity, of course, is actually this is a lot more, uh, it can be a lot more expensive in the finite dimension of the case because we have to compute the gram matrices. And um, so the, basically the, the, the computation of complexity is OM squared. And if we have like a set of N data, which is XI, then basically we need uh, the time, the time of computing the, the, all the pairwise uh, distances is like OM squared, M squared. So if M is large, then it can be quite, it, it, then it's, it's, it's a lot larger than in the finite dimensional setting. But nevertheless, as I said, it's actually, it can be com computed explicitly. Okay, now this is actually, uh, like for me, this is like the, the second, this manifold viewpoint is the most, uh, the most interesting part for me personally. Uh, okay, I wouldn't go slowly because um, it's actually more complicated than the, the thing that I talk about just now. So now, if we want to, we want to generalize the, the affine invariant Riemannian metric and the log Euclidean metric to this setting. So we want to define the log function first. We want to define the log function and we want to define kind of the, the distance between the log functions. So the infinite dimensional setting is actually significantly different from the finite dimensional setting because the log function, uh, also the determinant for the uh, determinant divergency, for example, actually they are only specific, you know, they're only well defined for specific classes of operators. And um, one crucial point is actually we always need to use this regularization A plus gamma I. Now, uh, this is, uh, we will talk about this called diagonal loading before. So in the finite dimensional setting, this is uh, necessary from a, a, an empirical viewpoint because the, the um, matrix, um, the, the empirical covariance matrix CX is not uh, guaranteed to be positive definite. So we always, we have to add like CX plus gamma I. But in, the, in this case, in the infinite dimensional settings, we always have to do uh, this regularization A plus gamma I, even if um, A has all the um, positive eigenvalues. So it's necessary both theoretically and empirically. So let's, mo let's try to motivate uh, this setting so we want to do, let's try to generalize this, uh, the log Euclidean distance, log A minus log B. Now when our A and B are now like, okay, let's think about them say in bounded operators, infinite, infinite matrix. So we want to generalize, first we want to generalize the log function, and then we want to generalize the, uh, the Frobenius uh, inner product and norm. And uh, one issue is actually the, the, the Himmler-Schmidt norm we talk about just now is actually not sufficient. So we have to do something like, we have to do one extra step. So there, are, okay, so there are two issues to consider here to generalize this formula. Okay. So now, in the, uh, if A is uh, an N by N uh, SPD matrix, then it has um, N eigenvalues lambda K, K from one to N, and with orthonormal eigenvectors U K. So it has a special decomposition. Uh, a k is written by k from one to n, uh, lambda k u k u k transpose. Okay. Now, so log a is just defined by by this uh, special decomposition. So it's given by the summation of log of lambda k u k u k transpose. It's very well defined. Now, if we uh, replace a by an infinite uh, matrix or an operator infinite matrix, then it actually has an infinite uh, number of eigenvalues lambda k. Now this lambda k, uh, we, we assume that, the, that they, always, they are always greater than zero, but the, the thing is actually that for covariance operators, they actually compact. The eigenvalues actually goes to zero. Um, now the eigenvalues go to zero, so A is written, A ha also has a special decomposition. Just think about this UK time tensor UK here, just UK, UK transpose. You can be thought about as UK, UK transpose. 
So we can define log A in the same way. And the summation of uh, log of lambda k um, times uk uk. Except now, the problem is actually that when uh, the problem is actually when we have an infinite number of eigenvalues in this case, lambda k goes to uh, zero, so the log of lambda k actually goes to negative infinity. So this is actually unbounded. This is not a well de uh, not a well defined um, bounded operator. It's like unbounded. So it's actually uh, not a good thing to do. So what, what is missing, so this is the, pro the first problem, is actually the log A is unbounded. So because limit of, uh, the limit of uh, lambda k when k goes to infinity equal to zero, and so what we need to do is actually we have to consider something we call positive definite operators. So in the uh, infinite dimensional setting, actually positive definite operators are actually, uh, it's a stronger property than just a uh, simply being strictly positive. So strictly positive means that all the eigenvalues are greater than zero. Now, but we want, uh, the positive definite operators uh, property actually says that we need to have this inner product of ax plus x is greater than or equal to ma times the norm of x squared where ma is greater than zero. So uh, in particular, the eigenvalues of a have to be bounded about from below by, uh, by this constant ma. Now, in the finite dimension, the setting is uh, it's automatically satisfied because we have like the MA can be said to be the smallest, uh, the smallest eigenvalue. Uh, so it's, it's automatic, it's automatic. But in the infinite dimension, the case because we have all the eigenvalues, even though they are all greater than zero, but they are going to zero. So this is not, uh, um, so this property is not satisfied. So we have to, we actually have to, to auto, we have to impose this property. It's a stronger than being strictly positive. So in the finite dimensional setting, uh, positive definite matrix A is equivalent to uh, strictly positive uh, matrix A. In the infinite dimensional settings, A is positive definite. It means that A is actually strictly positive and it has to be invertible. So this, um, the invertibility and the, the strict positivity are, are, not, uh, are not the same thing. Uh, uh, are actually two separate things for, for a positive definite operator when the number of eigenvalue is actually infinite. So this is actually, this is a, a crucial point. Are you following me? Good. Okay, so resolution. Um, okay, since it's actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's about it, we have to define, we have to, um, to, to ask for positive definite operators. And, so this regularization is actually a very, uh, a very um, a nice way of doing of, of doing it. So instead of a, we com we, co we compute like a plus gamma i, where gamma is greater than zero. For uh, and so this operate uh, if we we uh, uh, we, we um, use this form a plus gamma i, then log of a plus gamma i is always well defined and bounded because the eigenvalues are now uh, about to be low by by gamma. So it's very well quantifying about it. So this, this, um, so this, uh, we always use uh, this regularization a plus gamma i. This is well, this is one way of doing it. I'm sorry, say it again. Yeah, it's about it from below. Yeah, it's about it from below. Yeah, you need you need the regular uh, you need the positive definiteness to form a manifold structure. No, yeah, yeah, it would be it would have like a more general structure than just covariance operators. It has to actually, so it, it's a little bit different from the finite dimensional setting. Yeah. So actually, the the operators would have the form. Actually, the the operat operators would have the form a plus gamma. I. It's not just a alone. No, the, the space would be of the form, the, the elements in the space would be the form A plus gamma I. Yeah. I'm sorry, say it again, please.
No, we will talk about that the next. That's the next step. Actually, that's uh, the uh, the other issue. Yeah. So as I said before, there, you know, there were two issues. So that I was just talking about the first issue. I'm going to talk about the second issue next. So now the problem is actually, as I said, okay, so as you, as you, were, you, were, you were concerning, it was actually, one problem is actually with the, when we add uh, this uh, regularization, uh, uh, regularization, where am I? Okay. Okay, so we were talking about two issues. One is actually the, the generalization of the positive, of the, the, the log function, and now we talk about the, uh, the norm, right? The norm is, uh, so the Himmel-Schmidt norm is not sufficient. Now, the problem is actually here, the identity operator is actually not Himmel-Schmidt. So when we add, um, uh, so the norm of this uh, operator is actually infinite. So the trace is infinite. So when we add like this gamma i to the, uh, when we add this gamma i, to the, regular, to the regularization, it actually makes uh, uh, infinities happen. So, for example, the, when gamma is not equal to one, then the, 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 the Hindu-Schmidt number of log of a plus gamma is summation of all the log of lambda k plus gamma square. This one, because when, when k goes to infinity, lambda k will go to zero. So log of lambda k plus gamma will go, will go to log of gamma, and if gamma is not equal to one, then this will be infinite. And if we have like two multiples of the identity operator, we try to compute the log, um, uh, log of gamma i minus log of mu i, then it would just equal to the log of gamma over mu times uh, the uh, number of, of, of i, and it's just equal to infinite if gamma is not equal to, to mu. And so this is problematic. Of course, we cannot use it. So this was, um, this was actually the solution this was actually the, the, uh, the, the idea proposed by La Rotonda and colleagues. So what they consider is actually the, something called the extended uh, Himmel-Schmidt, uh, I'm sure what the Himmel-Schmidt space, instead of the extended Himmel-Schmidt operators. So it has a form, it has the form A plus gamma I, where A is Himmel-Schmidt as before, and gamma is also A plus gamma I. But now, instead of just the Himmel-Schmidt, they consider the extended Himmel-Schmidt inner product. So A plus gamma I, the inner product of A plus gamma I times uh, inner product with B plus mu I, in the, I, I write it e, e, HS for extended uh, Himmel-Schmidt, is equal, it's just the inner product of A, B, HS plus gamma nu. So this is actually a, 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 a form, they call it uh, compactification in, in mathematics, compactification. So actually they are kind of, they are, so here they define the scalar operators I to be orthogonal to the Himmel-Schmidt operators so that we can define like uh, that inner product over there. So we just take like A plus, the inner product of uh, mu I with A just equal to zero and gamma I would be just equal to zero. So if we define in this form, then uh, the, uh, the extended norm of A plus gamma I just equal to the, the, uh, the norm square, the Himmel-Schmidt norm square of A plus gamma square. So if we define it in this particular way, then when uh, A is equal to zero, if A, if A is equal to zero, then the number of gamma I square, the extended Himmel-Schmidt number is equal to one. Right, so, the, uh, so in this particular form, I'm oh, sorry, in this particular definition, this, in this definition, the norm of the uh, the norm of the identity operator is equal to one, it's said to be equal to one. Uh, whereas the, the Himmel-Schmidt norm of the identity operator is actually equal to infinite. So if they kind of, they try to come, uh, they, 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 they do it like they call it compactive, they kind of compactify it. They're forcing it to be, to be equal to one. So this is one, this is one solution. This is one way to do it. Okay, so this is actually, this is what, uh, uh, we have been following uh, the work of, uh, of La Rotonda and his colleagues. Okay, so now if we consider, uh, okay, so now we're not, instead of just A plus, now this, so we restrict ourselves to like a small, to a subset of this, uh, to a subset of this operator, to this form, instead of A plus gamma I, we consider the positive definite operators. A plus gamma I greater than zero, and so when, when A is actually self-adjoint, then this is actually, 
This is uh, something we call like Himmler-Schmidt manifold, a positive definite of Himmler-Schmidt operators. And it's an infinite dimensional manifold. So if we have, um, for, any, for any operator A plus gamma I in this, in this uh, manifold, then the norm of a uh, log of A plus gamma I is actually, it has two components. The first one is actually just the Himmler-Schmidt component. And the, first, the second one is uh, just log of gamma R squared. This is always less than infinity, so it's always well defined. Okay. So to summary, there are, uh, to generalize uh, the, the manifold of SPD matrices to the infinite dimensional setting to the manifold of positive definite operators. In the, so we, we, we arrived at these two by considering the two major differences in the uh, finite dimensional setting. The first one is actually log A is unbounded uh, for uh, an opera, a compact operator A. So we, we, uh, the uh, resolution is actually considering the form A plus gamma I. And the second one is actually the, because the, the, identity or, the identity operator is not Himmler-Schmidt. So that we consider the extended Himmler-Schmidt in the product and norm. So there are, there are two components of this, uh, uh, of this picture. So if we define this uh, manifold, uh, we call it sigma H, then the following are both well-defined on sigma H, like the generalization of the affine variant matrix and the log Euclidean matrix. So we can, we can generalize uh, both of them. But we always consider operators of the form A plus gamma I. It's, not, it's, no, longer just, uh, it's no longer just A. Any questions before I move on? Other questions? Okay. So this is a view, okay. So now let's talk about the, uh, um, the view of SI. So Riemannian manifold, now we have an infinite dimensional, now we have an infinite dimensional Riemannian manifold instead of finite dimensional Riemannian manifold. So well, we, we, we just have to think about these two, uh, these two, these two, um, Resolutions, yeah, the uh, regularization A plus gamma I and the extended Hindu Schmidt in the product and everything else actually, the formulas are actually uh, pretty much the same. So the FI um, uh, in, uh, invariant Riemannian metric was actually considered by Larotonda and was actually his thesis in 2005 and then was subsequently published in the, this article in 2007. And so, in the in the setting of RKHS uh, governance operators, uh, we kind of uh, we actually carried out like the explicit um, formula for the the distance between the uh, governance operators in the case of uh, in the case of um, RKHS governance operators. So, as you can see, that actually it's actually quite recent because for the uh, fine variant uh, in the infinite dimensional case, it was uh, done like it was kind of defined as, as far away as 1944, whereas in the infinite dimensional setting, it was only 2005. So, actually, quite recent. So the, the OBD, OB, so in the finite dimensional settings, we have the, sim, the, the tangent space at each point P is a set of symmetric uh, matrix uh, C band, whereas in the infinite dimensional setting, we just have the kind of the set um, H R here, where it's just uh, A plus gamma I, where A is um, A is um, self-adjoint or symmetric. So we just have to think about instead of A, we can consider A plus gamma I, where an A is Himmler Schmidt. And the formulas are actually pretty much the same. So the, in the, in the, the Riemannian metric is, uh, is, uh, has a very similar form. Instead of AB uh, in the product at P, we have A plus gamma I and B, uh, B plus mu I at P, uh, at the tangent space at P, and we have the same, we have the same formula. And it's, uh, it's also, a fine in, uh, also a fine variance. Basically, we have the same formula instead of uh, a and B and C, we have like uh, A plus gamma I and B plus mu I and C plus delta I. So the, the form, with the, the difference actually all the A, B and C here, they are all Himmler-Schmidt operators and we have the regularization. And of course we have to use, um, we have to use the extended Himmler-Schmidt uh, uh, inner product, but everything else, actually the formulas are actually all the same.
So this manifold is also geodesically complete, and it also has, actually also has non-positive uh, curvature, so it has uh, between any two operators, A and B, okay, I write A, okay, I write A and B here, but it's, it should be A plus gamma I, sorry. But anyway, I write, I write A and B. So the geodesic actually has the same form between any two, oper two uh, operators of the, of the form. It, on this manifold, we actually, we have the same, we have the same geodesic uh, equation and the same, the same exponential map. So the equations are the same. So it was the same as before. And now the, uh, the, uh, the Riemannian distance is also pretty much similar. So the, the Riemannian distance between uh, A plus gamma I and B plus mu I is equal to this log of A plus gamma I inverse a half B plus mu I, A plus gamma I inverse a half, with the, the difference being that it's the extended Hindler-Schmidt uh, norm instead of mm, just the Frobenius uh, distance. Okay, so it has, um, I, I said before that actually the, uh, they are quite different. So they are like the, the finite dimensional setting and the infinite dimensional setting um, are actually quite different. And um, so there are actually two different formulas. One of the case when the dimension of the space is, in, is equal to infinity. That is the first formula where the dimension doesn't appear because we set uh, I guess it, and we set the, uh, the, eigen, the, the norm of the uh, entity operator to be, to be equal to one. So there's no dimension in the, in the first formula, whereas in the second formula, where the dimension is finite, we're actually just using like the, um, the affine variant uh, distance in the finite dimensional case. We have like um, an explicit dependence on the dimension H. Okay, you, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, they are the same if gamma is equal to, to, to mu. If, uh, if you, if gamma is equal to mu, then log of, log of uh, gamma over mu is equal to zero. So we just have the first term, and they are the same. So they are, they are the same if gamma is equal to mu. Otherwise, they are different. Now, the good thing is actually they, um, we, can compute, we can compute this explicitly. The same as before, because we have, uh, we have this gram matrix. And so the, the distance between two um, RKHS covariance operators can be computed explicitly. Uh, via a closed form expression by um, using the gram matrices. It's actually, um, it's rather, uh, it's not a simple uh, closed form formula. Okay, I'm, I'm just giving the, the result. You don't have to worry about Sigma, but. Yes. <coughs> They actually, they are, yeah, you know, I'm just kind of defining it, but they are, they are just transposed to each other. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they are, yeah, they are, they are basically transposed to each other. Yeah. I'm just kind of writing it out, kind of everything explicitly, but yeah. They don't have to be, they don't have to be defined um, separately. Okay, I'm just I'm just showing this formula to, to, to show that they actually they can be computed explicitly, but because I uh, they're kind of complicated. But anyway, so it just we just compute like the the um, the trace of a the log of a three m by three m uh, matrix plus a constant, where there are all these like okay, these matrices are all defined all m by m matrices defined in terms of the gram matrix is k x y and k x and k y, but just to show you that they can be computed explicitly. So if we have this, all these matrices here, then we have like an, a 3M by 3M matrix, we can compute the, all the eigenvalues and we can compute the log and we sum all them together. So that's that. And in the finite dimension, the setting is before, we, there's a, like a, a, a big difference. Actually, we have the dimension of HK appearing, appearing in, the, in the second term. So in particular, when the dimension of A, if we have, we fix, now the special case of this is actually if, if uh, in, the linear, uh, in the linear case, this has to reduce to the, uh, this formula has to reduce the second formula here, finite dimension, I think, in the case where K is a linear kernel. So the dimension, when it, the dimension of HK is, is less than, is finite, it's like the polynomial kernels. So the first, the first formula applies to the Gaussian kernel, for example, and the second 
the second here, one dimensional less, uh, is finite, then it applies to the polynomial kernels. In particular, in the case when we have the linear kernel, then it reduces to the, uh, um, the uh, phi invariant difference between Px plus gamma i and Cy plus, but between the covariance matrices plus, plus, uh, plus mu i. So this can be used actually to verify whether this, uh, whether this formula is correct in the, in the case when the, the kernel is linear. We can, we can just compute this formula for, for the linear kernel using the gram matrices, and we can compute on the right-hand side, we can compute it uh, just using the covariance matrix. So they have to, they have to agree. So that's, that's one, one way to verify it. Now, if we fix M, then as the dimension HK goes to infinity, this formula, of course, goes to, goes to infinity. So uh, that's, that's what I meant by saying that actually the, the infinite dimension and the finite dimension formula is actually quite different. And in general, we cannot, we cannot uh, approximate the infinite dimensional formulation by the, by the finite dimensional counterpart, except in some special cases. Now, in this case, when gamma is not equal to nu, so we can, we can approximate in the case when gamma is equal to nu because they have the same, they have the same form. So to summarize, in the finite dimensional, uh, in the, for the affine invariant matrix, basically we can, do, we can do essentially the same. We have the same formulas for for the, uh, for the affine invariant matrix, we have the same uh, geodesic, the same exponential map, the same distance, except that we just have, we just have one, two things. We have the uh, regularization A plus gamma I, and, we, and then we have the extended, um, and we have the extended um, Hilbert-Schmidt uh, norm. Otherwise, everything else is actually the same. So it's the same for the, for the log Euclidean metric, it's the same. Uh, we can do in the same way. Okay, this is like the computational complexity. Okay, I will not, okay, I will not, I will not talk about that so much. So in the lab the matrix, actually it can be the same, it's basically the same way. So I just talk about the distance here. Um, so we, we uh, so we actually, we were kind of strong, strongly influenced by the work of Laurent Tonda. And then, uh, so we did this actually, uh, After, after uh, and also like by the work of uh, Asini et al. and, and Penek et al. in uh, for the log Euclidean distance. So remember that we were talking about this like two operations, uh, the O dot here and then the, the star operations in the case of the SPD matrices. So in the same way we can do, we can do it in the same in the same way for the uh, in the infinite dimensional setting. Except that we instead of uh, doing A B we have like A plus gamma I O dot plus plus, plus mu I. The exponential block of a plus gamma i plus the b plus mu i in the same way for the for the star operations. Now, if so if we do this and the set of sigma h, this uh, a plus gamma, where a plus gamma i is greater than zero, and with the dot and the star operation, it's the vector space. So as I said, it's the same it's the same thing. With the, the o dot acting as vector addition and the star acting as scalar multiplication. And so we can define like the the inner, well, the inner product, we can define the, um, the log of uh, a plus, uh, log of a plus, um, a plus gamma i, log, log h as inner product, as log of a plus gamma i plus log of, log of b plus mu i, with the inner product being the extended Himmler-Schmidt inner product, and the norm being the, norm, the extended uh, Himmler-Schmidt norm of log of a plus gamma i. And so the distance, so now if we do this, then the, Sigma h with these two operations, uh, dot and star, is a vector space, and if we uh, include the, the log h s in the product as well, then it's the Hilbert Schmidt, uh, the Hilbert space. So we can actually define it when we show that it's actually Hilbert space, and then we have the distance. Now, if instead of the distance of log of a plus log b, we just have the distance of log of a plus gamma i minus log of log of b plus mu i, and the extended Hilbert Schmidt distance. So, as I said before, it's, a, it's actually this, uh, the same formulas. And then, again, we can, uh, we can have, we have the exact, uh, we have the uh, kind of the closed form expression in terms of the, we have the closed form expression in terms of the gram, of the gram matrices. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about these formulas. I'm, I'm just showing these formulas to show that actually they can be, uh, because they're actually quite complicated, but the, they can be computed explicitly. There are explicit formulas for them in the case when, this is in the case when the dimension of HK is equal to infinite. So for the Gaussian kernel, and the case when, uh, 
and the uh, and uh, and this is the case when the dimension is finite for for, for the polynomial kernels. As I as before, now the that's a, the big difference here is actually we have like the dimension of H K appearing explicitly in the formula. And again, in, in the case when we have the linear kernel, then uh, the log uh, the log HS distance uh, you can see a phi x plus gamma uh, i and phi y plus gamma, but new i has to be the same as the log Euclidean distance between uh, the, the covariance matrix phi x uh, plus gamma i and phi y plus uh, plus new i, and the same thing for the for the inner product and the norm. So this is also like um, basically the way to to verify. Uh, whether the, the formula in, in this uh, second, uh, in this, this, this formula is correct in the, in the case of the linear kernel. So once again, when, uh, when these two, uh, when gamma is not equal to nil, then this actually goes to infinity when, when the dimension SK goes to infinity. So the infinite dimension formulation cannot be approximated by the finite dimensional case if gamma is not the same thing as nil. Okay. Okay. Uh, I I would not have time to talk about the approximate version, but okay. Let's talk about the, the, the we we'll talk about the computation of complexity and then why we try we. So it's actually we need to compute like the SVD and the the the, the gram matrix is uh, f size n by m. So it requires a computation of complexity is actually O M Q. And if we have a set of n matrix eta matrices, then like the the computation of complexity for computing all of these pairwise distances is actually n square. O and square and so and Q, so if M is large, then it's actually quite expensive. So now I will not go into detail. I won't probably I won't talk about this uh, actually in, in my next talk, but uh, the the computational complexity of the, of of this uh, it can be quite high. So one way to do is actually to carry it to to um, to perform like approximation. So we have also done like some approximation. Uh, uh, um, uh, approximation. So the, what if we, we do it in the CPPR paper in 2016, where we compute an approximate version of the log Hilbert distance, and other researchers have done it for the um, for other distances as well. So this uh, will allow us to uh, to reduce the computation of course by uh, maintaining the uh, the, accur the uh, accuracy of the distance, the discriminative, uh, discriminative properties of the distance. Okay, now I will not talk about the convex cone uh, viewpoint because actually it also it requires too much time. But um, this uh, can be done also in, the, in, the, in, in a very, um, in, in a rigorous way mathematically as well. Uh, we tried to do it, we actually did this recently in a paper in Linear Children Applications 2017, it's actually just published. So in the, instead of you doing the, uh, the extent of Himmler Schmidt, we actually, uh, because the log determinant divergence is defined in terms of the determinants, so we actually have to extend the concept of determinants and, and the set of, uh, basically, it, um, trace, instead of inverse Schmidt operators, we actually have trace class operators. And uh, these actually can be generalized in a, uh, um, in, a, in a very uh, general setting as well. So we actually have kind of generalized also the affine invariant Riemannian metric and the alpha beta divergences um, Mm, uh, in the finite, the infinite dimension thing of the alpha beta divergence can be generalized as well. So these can all be generalized in the infinite dimensional setting, and they all have, in the case of uh, governance operators in RKHS, they all have closed forms. They, can, they all can all be computed. Now, the, the only the main issue is actually um, the computation of complexity. Okay, so I went. Okay, so I was talking just, uh, I was talking about the Hindle Schmidt distance, and I was uh, in a product, I was talking about the affine invariant Riemannian distance, and uh, also the log Hindle Schmidt distance and in the product. And then, as I said before, the most important thing that uh, we, we care about here, of course, is actually there are explicit formulas by a gram matrices for, in the case of RKHS covariance um, operators, everything can be computed explicitly. So that is a, a, nice, uh, a nice feature of, uh, of, um, of kernels. So now let's um, let's see how we can apply this uh, in in, uh, in an application. So okay, I will just talk about kernel methods here. Now, not not so much work uh, has been done um, 
in the infinite dimensional setting uh, yet, uh, but it's still, there's, there's still uh, there's a lot of um, active research going on. So uh, let's talk about kernel methods. And now the, the set of uh, the sigma h with this operator, that, uh, we talk about dot, O dot and star and with the lock Hilbert Smith in the product, it's a Hilbert Smith. It's a Hilbert space. So we can define kernels on this space. We can define the polynomial kernels. The first one, the polynomial kernels using the, the inner product, uh, log hs, and the second one is just the Gaussian kernel because it's a Hilbert, uh, it's a Hilbert space, so we can define all these kernels. So now at first, so it means that we can actually have like a two-layer kernel machine, so okay, we don't have any, uh, there's a lot of uh, deep learning and uh, there's a lot of interest in deep learning, so I don't have anything deep here, I just have two layers. Uh, the first one, so if we have like the first kernel, K1, it induces the covariance operators, and then you can define like the second layer with the kernel K2, defined using the Lockheed machine in the, in the product of distance. So you can have a two-layer kernel machine. You can have this. So before, we just have uh, one kernel. Now we have two kernels. So for the uh, task of image classification, we first we start with, uh, we start with the uh, image, and then we, we apply a kernel K1. Now this implicitly, uh, defines a covariance operator. And then, and we can compute like a lot, uh, HS uh, um, in a product or, or distance between these uh, covariance operators. So we obtain a distance matrix. And then on top of that, we can define like kernel K2. And then we can define like uh, any kernel method, uh, for example, the SPM classification. So we have like um, a two layer kernel machine. So let's see how. Uh, Let's see how, so this is actually quite, um, this is um, yeah, it's, um, highly nonlinear. So let's see how it performs compared to the finite dimensional setting. So I'm gonna do this uh, on the, uh, mm -hmm. okay. I'm gonna show some examples using for image classification using the, uh, for each image is represented by uh, one covariance operator. So let's just, okay, let's do a few tasks here. If fish recognition material classification so this is like a fish recognition where we have like 23 species of fish uh, acquired from live videos. So this one, okay, this is actually the, uh, this uh, numerical experience we carry out by my collaborators, Marco San Biagio. So for example, for this uh, operation, we were just using like the R, G, and B channels. And you can see that actually, so let's look at the first line where we have the equilibrium, and then the, the third line where we have the log equilibrium and we move to the uh, Himmler Schmidt, and then we have the log HS. So this is actually, this is the OSVM. Uh, okay, so now you can see that actually there's a big charm between uh, log, A, log E and log HS using just RGB channels. Okay, and uh, so for the, uh, for the KTH tips, we were talking about it before of material classification where we're using uh, uh, the red, green, and blue, and then the Gabo filters. So we were also like uh, comparing with the, uh, between the uh, Euclidean and log E and then HS and we have the log HS. And we are in the final, in the final line is actually, um, it's actually using CNN features from Matt Connefs. And the, you can see it's actually compared to the Euclidean, the, uh, the Euclidean case is also like a, a very nice improvement over the final dimensional setting. Of course, uh, I would like to actually to kind of explore this uh, more with the, with the CNN features. This is only like a kind of some, uh, some preliminary results with the CNN features. So, oh, there's one more. We were doing, we were showing this in the, uh, with the ETH data set in the, uh, in the finite dimensional case. And actually, the, I'm, I'm showing results here obtained using the, actually the approximate distance, so it's not, it's actually even less if you look at the, the exact distance. So you can actually see that actually there's a big jump between the, the finite dimensional and the infinite dimensional setting um, from the, yeah, when we go to from the finite case to the infinite case. Now this is actually what we, what we should expect uh, because the covariance operators simply have, uh, by being um, much more nonlinear, so they, they, they should be able to capture um, the correlation between the features better than the finite dimensional case. So of course, uh, of course, uh, the, um, the most important uh, kind of uh, thing to, uh, w uh, from a numerical viewpoint, you know, we have to um, 
the most important feature here to, to think about is actually that they are computationally intensive. That is, uh, that is uh, the, the drawback. Okay, so we have been talking about uh, kind of the infinite dimension and something of Riemannian manifold, uh, uh, and which is actually kind of, uh, I would say that like a, a rather um, abstract, very ab uh, highly abstract area of mathematics, uh, which is actually quite recent. And then it can be actually applied, um, it can be actually, um, there are many things we can compute explicitly and we actually can apply it in practice. So we were talking about here, the two-layer kernel machine with the log uh, uh, Schmidt metric, and uh, it actually has, it can it can achieve substantial gains in performance compared to the finite dimension case. But uh, of course, as I mentioned before, it has high computational cost. So we were talking about we actually uh, proposed recently like um, an approximate method for the um, log Hilbert Schmidt distance. Where it was in CVPR 2016. Uh, I'm hoping to have more. I am hoping to have more work along this line uh, in the near future. So, uh, so to summarize, oh. I think I'm going too fast. <laughs> okay, to sum, okay, I, I, would, I would go back with, uh, if people have questions, I would go back to the slides. To summarize, we have, um, we have data represented, uh, we're talking about data representation by covariance matrix, or covariance operators, and we were talking about the geometry of covariance operators with the Himmler Schmidt distance and inner product, and the phi invariant remaining distance and inner product. We were talking about the log Himmler Schmidt in the system product as well, and we were talking about the two layer kernel machine and some experiments in image classification. So the thing is actually the the infinite dimensional setting is, 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 is quite different, as you can see, it's quite different from the finite dimensional case. So we have to define like all the, everything, the positive definite operators or the himmler schmidt the extended himmler schmidt operators, these have to be defined carefully. But at the same time, the, uh, the, the different things that we were talking about before for the finite dimensional case, the log Euclidean metric, the affine invariant Riemannian metric, and the, they actually can all be generalized to the finite dimensional setting. And it's possible that we can obtain substantial gains in performance, but then they have like higher computational cost, computa computational, computational cost compared to the finite dimensional setting. So there's still a lot of, um, it's still undergoing a lot of um, studying, both theoretically and computationally. So that's a lot of um, research actually in mathematics on the infinite dimensional setting of, of Riemannian manifold. This is actually just an exam, one example of the infinite dimension of Riemannian uh, geometry, but there are actually many other, other, many other manifolds as well. Okay, so, so okay, I, I, I'm talk, I wanna talk about some future uh, directions here. So of course, now covariance matrices have, have appeared everywhere, like in, in many different um, areas of um, computer vision and imaging and signal processing and machine learning and statistics and, and brain imaging and brain computer interfaces so a lot of other areas and we actually have only basically talk about the uh, kind of the, the image classification there are many other things that that can be and could be considered so I would hope to to be able to get involved in some some more applications uh, in the near future and one thing that um, Recently, now of course, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in deep learning recently. So recently, there actually there have been work that incorporate these covariance matrices and covariance operators in deep learning. So there is this work by Jonas Guerrero actually here. So basically, they people also like there are some reasons why people actually consider like a network of, of, of SPD matrices uh, and uh, and um, in, for like, as in, in an end-to-end -end, uh, learn, learning network. So this is actually a very interesting uh, uh, direction and that could, um, that, you know, that could be explored and form a, now from a, from a theoretical viewpoint, of course actually there's also a lot of work to be done. For example, we can, we can uh, find a connection between the geometry of positive definite operators and with the Gaussian measure, probability, Gaussian probability measure in the infinite dimensional setting because in the, Finite dimensional setting, we have the connection between the divergences, uh, the log determinant divergences and the Rayleigh divergence and the affine invariant Riemann energy with the fischer round metric in the information geometry. So there's a lot of interesting direction as well. 
So this is some only some of the future direction that I'm thinking of. But uh, one can also like carry out optimization uh, and generalization of optimization methods on, on from the uh, manifold of uh, finite dimensional manifold to the infinite dimensional setting as well. So there actually there's a lot of um, things to do. So as this is only actually just a start, basically. So to conclude, uh, I have, in the first part, I gave an overview of the finite dimensional setting of covariance matrices and its representation. And then, and then later on, uh, we'll talk about the generalization to the infinite dimensional setting via Kerner methods. So we were talking about the covariance operator representation and the geometry of these uh, operators, and we talk about Kerner methods. So basically, the generalization is done by, uh, is done by, uh, by the feature map of, of Kerner methods. Um, as I said before, everything can be computed uh, actually using closed form formulas. So, uh, okay, I would have, uh, I, would, I would actually make these slides available on the website of the workshop if, uh, I, okay, so I think I'm stuck. I'm sorry, it's only 12, 12, oh wait. Okay, I, I'm open to questions. Right, so actually uh, in, um, in practice, what we, uh, what we do is actually we will like, uh, we actually set them into the same graph for every, for, every, uh, for every image, we actually do it the same. Now, but in the theory, the theory doesn't say anything about, uh, doesn't say anything about this actually whether they, are, they have to be, they, have, don't, they don't have to be uh, the same, actually they can be different. But in practice, we actually set them to be the same, whereby we can do like cross validation. But normally, we say, yeah, we set them to be the same. Actually, I, I would have like I would uh, I should have some upcoming work on on this uh, on the value of of, of of gamma, but it's actually uh, it, it's 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 more it's kind of more subtle. It's, it's like You mean the the, uh, the the gram matrix? You mean the gram? No, the gram. Yeah. I, I think I think that yeah I think it could be. Oh, I, th I think that could uh, yeah I think I think that's interesting yeah. I didn't think about I didn't think about it yeah. So sure, sure, please. We have we have time actually because we are finishing all. We have to, it's only twelve <laughs> ten past twelve. I, I know. I think it was just uh, because it was like uh, it was just actually to compare with the other other previous work in the you know, like you know, using the finite dimensional case. That's why it was like using the same protocol. Actually, it was yeah, it, it wasn't motivated by by yeah, it was motivated to just to have the fairness of comparison with other yeah, previous well, work. Yeah. It was yeah. It was not a fundamental, but it w I would be uh, it would be kind of very interesting if actually it, if it can be done for like a small small training um, sample size. But it, it was not motivated by that. No, it was actually just to have a fairness of comparison with other work, in the same uh, the same experimental protocol, basically.
we yeah we use the Gaussian kernel yeah 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 they clean the for the Gaussian yeah right 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 right. I, I don't remember I, I don't I don't know I don't think this is actually I, this is actually a small no this is actually just um okay I didn't I didn't carry out the, this experience myself actually but but this data set is actually quite uh, kind of small it's not a big data set no we actually the kind of pre-training this is actually this um this math con it's actually you just uh, like you use the, the pre-training uh, layers and then you apply this uh, the, uh, this images to the to the um, to the math con yeah just for learning yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't remember. As I said, I don't remember. I didn't do the experience. This experience, I don't remember the. I don't remember the, the sign. But it's actually it's not. It's small. It's, it's just a small data set. Actually, it's not a big data set. Any other questions? I'm sorry, can, can you say it louder? I, I uh, just to clarify, so what if we compare the pure Cayenne version to the test, to the model test version of the Cayenne test? Uh, and so what if we just want more Cayenne scale and we could use it in a trivial classification? And also we use the I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether I follow your question. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so maybe the training set is very small. Would you use a small network? Uh, something like a, a the one. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I know what you mean. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Now, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Actually, I, I don't really consider this. Okay. I, I don't consider this as an alternative to CNN. I actually would see this as. Um, I would like to see CNN features as a complement because this actually this is a method for comparing for computing for computing distances and for for um, basically for fusing different features. So the features can be a CNN features. It can be any features. So I, I'm not. I'm not uh, considering this as an alternative to CNN. No. I'm, I would actually say. As a complement to CNN. Like the yeah, the distance yeah yeah yeah. I, I would like to see this as a kind of using the uh, to exploit the features of CNN and, and then combining them together. I would that is that is how I would like to see it. So this is like kind of applying it on top of CNN features. Not as a not as a not as an alternative no. Because it's a method, it's really a method for combining features. Yes, please. To the, yeah, for, for, no, no, no. It's not. It's not because of the non-positive eigenvalues. Actually, it's because, um, because actually, 
even if all the eigenvalues are greater than zero, because they, they all go to zero. No, no, it's not, it's not positive, semi, it's not uh, semi-definite. It's actually, they are all greater than zero, but they go to zero. So it's, everything is actually strictly positive, but they go to zero. So then uh, the log, for example, because the log one goes to negative infinity. So it's not because of the eigenvalues are, uh, are zero, actually, it's because they go to zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So actually, it's, uh, that's why it's actually, um, it's, a, that's, it's a crucial difference between the um, infinite and finite dimensional case. Because in the finite dimensional case, we do regularization because the matrix can be positive semi-definite. In this case, even if everything is actually positive, we still have to do regularization. Yes, please. No, yeah, you can if you can yeah, you can define like your, your matrix space is a lot more general, yeah. Uh, what, 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 which metric uh, would you like to define? Which oh, sure, yeah, sure. If you, yeah, if you can define like a nice, yeah, a nice, a nice metric sp yeah, space, yeah, there's no, yeah. Well, if you, if, well, for in this case, for example, it's actually, um, well, in general, you, when you define like a metric, uh, you, when you define a metric, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's a, it's a very trivial task, actually. In this case, we actually get, like, if we have, like, this, for example, this as a metric, we, could, we actually get all the properties of the metric by the fact that it's actually, it's actually it comes from a, an inner product, so we get all the, um, all the properties of the metric. But I think if you can define like a, a, a metric, uh, a nice metric, then there's no reason why you actually you need to do to go over this. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot more general. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So you get like the metric basically for free. The, all the axioms of the metric, like the yeah. It, it may not be so easy to, comp to, to, to prove, for example, the triangle inequality. So, like, for example, in the, the symmetric Stein divergence that Asra actually proved this property in 2012, like, to, to prove that it's actually the square root of this divergence is a metric, it's not, it's far from trivial, actually. It's a pretty hard uh, um, thing to prove, actually. The other, the, like, the positivity is, is uh, and then the symmetry is a bit straightforward, but the, uh, the triangle inequality is actually very hard to prove. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not, um, so that, that's what I'm saying, like people, you, know, you get it for free from, by, by considering this like vector space uh, thing, yeah. But if you can do it, of course, why not? <laughs> also, like the, the actually the, um, we have like, well, for example, this case, uh, the, um, the, the fact that actually you can, you can compute like the Gaussian kernel using the star, symmetric style divergence of whether to show that it's positive definite for a certain set of, um, for the certain choices of the parameter sigma, it's actually also a pretty hard, uh, pretty hard uh, thing to, 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 to show as well. It's actually very involved. We still have time. <laughs> Any further questions? I'm happy to answer questions because I'm actually uh, we are still working on this. Actually, this, uh, there's a lot more work to, to do. So. I, I would like to, to be able to apply this to, to more um, to more kind of applications. I'm kind of working on more the kind of the more the theoretical side, but I would be very uh, very happy to to actually to collaborate with anybody who would like to, to apply this to an application. As I said before, like if there are a lot of applications of covariance matrices, but so far we have we have only considered like some applications of these covariance operators. So 
must also be room for for so for for more work, a lot more work to to come. Any further questions? If not, then we uh, we can stop here. So we um, are. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.